Hey guys, so I don't like to do a little preamble before videos, I think it's pointless, but it has been three months since I've uploaded, and this is an hour and a half long video, so you can probably deal with an extra minute being wasted in the beginning. I just wanted to apologize for how long it's been since I've uploaded a proper video, and give a sort of explanation. Basically, I've just had the concept for this video in my mind for a very long time, and I just had to make it happen. And it took a whole lot of coordination, a whole lot of work, a lot of writing, everything, it was a huge process. But now that this one's done, I can go back to making my normal content on a much more consistent schedule, so don't expect another three month long wait. And on that note, I'd also just like to thank everyone for their patience, especially my patrons. I know it can be frustrating to be donating to somebody every month only to not get a video that entire month. That patience really does mean the world to me. I know that this video isn't one that's relevant to everyone in my audience, but it's something that I really felt I had to make, and Everyone sticking with me through this process really means a lot. But okay, let's get into the video. So here we are again, in this car, in this park, at 3 a.m. in the dead of winter. A little over two years ago, I transitioned male to female. This was a complicated process involving almost a year of incognito mode Google searching nearly every single night. Hundreds of dollars wasted on products that ultimately weren't what I needed, and above all else, desperately searching for this exact video. In trying to learn what exactly my goals should have been, I was stuck with nothing but uninformative vlogs, grooming advice from extremely male-centric channels, and poetic, romanticized, ultimately unhelpful perspectives on the day-to-day nitty-gritty of being a trans woman. There were forums out there for me, but really, I didn't even know what questions I was supposed to be asking. I didn't know what I didn't know. More than anything else, I wanted to find a trans femme field guide a relatively professionally produced compendium of all things trans femme. Something to steer my ship towards. I could never find that video, so now, two years later, I guess it falls on me to produce it. My name's Penelope, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Be Yourself Regardless, a trans femme field guide. So let's get some things clear right off the bat. This video is for a few different groups of people. Trans women, trans femme non-binary or agender people, trans questioning people, and people who just want to know more about what we have to put up with on a day-to-day -day basis. This video is most definitely not for bigots. Given that my channel has been largely focused around gaming for most of its existence, I'd urge you to not scroll down to the comment section until it's been out for a few weeks and the inevitable bigotry has been buried under the positive comments. And for the love of God, do not sort by no. Secondly, while I'm going to do my best to get perspectives from other trans feminine people with other perspectives, most of this is just coming from my own experience. So there are a few things that I simply don't know anything about. First off, I was fortunate enough to have an accepting family for the most part. So while I'll try to find somebody better to speak on it, I personally can't give much practical advice on the messy topic of coming out to a bigoted family. As far as hormone replacement therapy goes, for various medical reasons that I'll touch on later, I'm stuck using these patches rather than pills or needles or some other method of delivering estrogen. Thirdly, I'm not planning on having any sort of surgery, so again, I'm not personally able to speak on those things. Fourthly, I live in America, in a state where I can get my required medical provisions without too much hassle, so I can't speak on DIY HRT or the awful British healthcare system. As I said, I'll try to supplement these gaps in my experience with testimonies and advice from people who do know what they're talking about with these things, but as I write this, I don't know exactly what form that will take. Lastly, this video will largely take the perspective of somebody who wants to pass as a woman. I understand that not everyone is too worried about that. However, I personally want my transition to be as small a part of my life as possible, so I do my best to never get clocked, and will be talking about it from that perspective. You might be tempted to ask, well, what makes you an expert? Absolutely nothing. By no means am I an expert. I'm a homegrown, self-taught trans woman. However, knowledge is power, and I believe it's my responsibility to share what knowledge I do have. One last thing. If you're in a position where it's either inconvenient or dangerous to watch a video about being trans, I provided a copy of this script and text in the description. 
So, with that foreword finished, let's continue into the glossary. Consider each one of these chapter titles to be a content warning, and feel free to skip around the video as you like. However, I must warn you now, some of these sections will run the risk of introducing you to some new dysphorias. Maybe you've never even imagined having toenail dysphoria before. Well, watching this video might introduce you to some new perspectives on your body that maybe you'd prefer to stay ignorant of. If that is the case, all I can say is best of luck to you. This is a question that I see posted almost every day on trans forums. While the answer is usually as simple as you just know, that isn't always the case. You might think that you're not trans because that never manifested in your early childhood. You aren't running around in your mom's dresses or playing with Barbie dolls. Well, one, that's not a requirement, and two, if you're anything like me, you might start to retroactively realize that your past was full of eggy behavior. Me, I used to shower with the lights off and fantasize not about being with a woman, but specifically being in a lesbian relationship. Point is, if you want to know whether or not you're trans, the best way to figure it out is to simply think about it really hard for a long while. Some people might just know, but a lot of us need to spend some time toying with the idea. Personally, I spent about six months publicly trans questioning. I asked my community and my friends to use whatever pronouns they like with me, and after a few months I was certain that she, her pronouns were the ones that I liked the most. Try on different clothes, do your lipstick, paint your nails, shave your legs, just see how you like the general idea, and from there, you'll get a better idea of how you feel. Remember, imposter syndrome, the nagging thought of what if I'm not really trans, afflicts almost all of us. And remember that just because certain people use detransitioners as a way of saying that all trans people are deluded, that absolutely does not mean that you're not allowed to detransition. It doesn't make you a bad person, it doesn't invalidate trans people. However, if imposter syndrome is nagging at you, my best advice would be to just find a quiet, nice spot and meditate on the question for an hour or so. Reflect on your experiences and surmise from that how you feel. More to the point, figuring out whether or not you're trans can take a long time for some people. Some people might just know, but that isn't always the case. Personally, I toyed with my feminine side for about six years before I even considered transitioning. There's no such thing as being too old to transition, so if you feel unsure, don't be afraid to take your time and really understand how you feel. The decision to transition is most likely the biggest decision you'll ever make on this earth. There's absolutely nothing wrong with giving that decision the gravity that it demands. Long story short, there's no 2 plus 2 equals trans equation for you to check yourself against. It's a deeply personal question that can only be answered with deeply personal introspection. That's all that there is to it. All I can really say is just take your time, experiment, and see how you feel. Well, a lot of ways. Your friends and family are probably going to act like they're walking on eggshells with you, totally afraid to say anything that they think might offend you, at least at first. They'll usually get used to it pretty quickly. You should encourage the people around you to ask questions. Believe me, it's very annoying to be a mouthpiece for the entire trans community when you yourself only just started, but helping the people around you learn isn't just good for yourself, it's good for all of us, the whole world. People are going to apologize way too much every time they misgender you. Unfortunately, that one kind of just comes with the territory. Give people some leeway, odds are they're trying their best. What seems simple and obvious to you and I might be incredibly complicated to the people around you. So give them that leeway, but make sure that you set up a few very clear boundaries. A few days into my transition, my dad asked me, well, you can be a woman and still be my son, right? And I just had to tell him outright, no. I've had to tell people to keep my dead name 100% out of their mouth. Nobody but myself has the right to say that name when referring to me. Set boundaries with your pronouns, too. I've had a few people exclusively refer to me with they-them pronouns ever since I transitioned, when I've made it very clear that I use she-her pronouns. While, like anyone else, they aren't necessarily doing it maliciously, I recommend nipping things like that in the bud as early as you can. Minor annoyances can turn into major irritants with enough time. That's all just the short-term stuff, the social changes that you'll need to watch out for as soon as you tell people your new pronouns. But there are also some other social changes that will follow you for the rest of your life when you transition. In the case of us trans femmes, you'll very likely start to be treated a lot differently once you start passing with confidence. Creepy old men will hit on you. People will practically break their necks to open doors for you. People will stand way too close to you when you're out and about. Some people will even get a bit too handsy, foregoing friendly handshakes for not-so-friendly hugs. The most frustrating thing about all of this is that when it happens the first couple of times, a whole lot of trans femme people I know, myself included, have said that a part of them kind of liked that stuff at first. Gender affirmation by any means necessary, right? 
Don't beat yourself up if you catch yourself getting butterflies the first time someone sexually harasses you, thinking things like, oh wow, they have no idea that I'm trans. Those feelings, uncomfortable and conflicting as they are, are totally natural, and they'll pass very quickly, I promise. After a little bit, you'll be living your life like any other woman, only with a heavier emphasis on shaving. As nice as it would be if we were truly equal, the world just treats women a bit differently than it does men. We'll get more into that in a later chapter, but odds are you've got some women in your life. You've already seen most of what you can expect just by watching them. Odds are, if you're even thinking about going trans femme, you've already experimented with shaving. Well, I'm about to drop a bombshell that most of you really won't like to hear. If you've already experienced a testosterone puberty, your body hair will likely never stop growing on its own. Some parts of your hair, notably your chest, might start to thin out a bit after you've been on HRT for a while, but once those hair follicles are in place, you're pretty much stuck with them unless you get some sort of hair treatment. I'll get to all of those in a minute, but unaltered, your hair follicles will grow at about the same rate as they always have. It's incredibly annoying and disheartening. I'll talk about shaving in a moment, but as I understand it, the only way to permanently stop hair growth is to have electrolysis done. A practitioner will stick a near microscopic needle into each individual hair follicle and zap it with a bit of electricity, completely killing the follicle. And even after that, future hormonal changes, or stress even, can cause new follicles to develop in some patients. Don't worry, I'm pretty sensitive to pain and it really is no worse than tweezing, it sounds much worse than it is. It takes a long time though. I'm about 4 30 minute sessions in and we've covered about an eighth of my right tit. Now, I've been an especially hairy person since around 5th grade, so it might not be so drastic for you, but if you decide to go in for electrolysis, be prepared to spend a lot of time and a lot of money at that clinic. Search around and you can find some pretty good deals, but do expect to add about another $120 or so to your monthly expenses if that's the route you decide to go down. Unfortunately, this stuff usually isn't covered by insurance. Alternatively, you've got laser hair removal. If you've got light skin and dark hair, this is a great option for you. An infrared lighting element, about the size of a razor's head, is pressed against the skin and a light is blasted into your skin. The light is emitted at a frequency that is specifically engineered to target darker pigmentation, so if you have dark skin or light hair, this might not be an option for you. However, it's also relatively painless if done properly, and can cover a much larger area much faster than electrolysis can. Laser isn't totally permanent, expect yearly appointments for maintenance once the initial sessions are done. Personally, I'm going to get electrolysis on my upper lip, as those hairs are especially insidious in myself and a lot of other trans women people, and eventually I'm going to get laser for all of the larger areas, chest, stomach, legs, ass, etc. It's not a pretty topic, I know, but odds are pretty good that hair removal advice is exactly why you clicked on this video, so let's move on to some at-home solutions. First off, Nair, or similar hair removal creams. You might be tempted to use this stuff to cut down on your shaving time. Just listen to me here, it's not worth it. Results are spotty at best, and you have a seriously good chance of getting some very uncomfortable burns on your skin, and a 100% chance of completely stinking up the bathroom with the smell of melting hair. It just isn't worth it, simple as. Another option that really doesn't work for 90% of people, myself included, is the IPL. It's a little at-home laser hair removal device. They're expensive, tedious as all hell to use, and almost definitely not going to give you any real results. Leave them on the shelf. So with those two crossed out, we've also got the dreaded epilator. This is a little demon device from hell. I don't drink or do drugs anymore, but if you've got a sturdy pain tolerance and do drink, this might be a viable option for you. It's a rotating head with a few dozen tweezers on it. Basically, you're quickly tweezing large areas of your skin at once. It's most definitely as painful as it sounds. Make sure to open up your pores by taking a hot shower and exfoliating with a rough cloth like this one before even trying this thing. Every bit of dead skin that's in the way of your hairs is just going to make this thing more and more painful. The advantage to this, however, is that, like tweezers, your hair is going to take a few days longer to show itself again, unlike shaving, which can often leave you prickly after just a few hours. Then you've got your traditional tweezers. The same showering and exfoliation rules apply, but these are a bit better for the faint of heart, and those with a need to occupy their hands. For the love of God, just make sure you don't go digging into your skin to try and pull out an ingrown hair, a hair that's been trapped under the skin. That little black dot is annoying, but an abrasion in its place is much worse. I have a few of them on my chest right now, even though I haven't done this in months. Just keep on exfoliating daily, and those ingrown hairs will free themselves with time. 
Tweezing is more of a hobby than an effective method of large-scale hair removal, though. For practical purposes, you should save tweezing for the extremely sensitive areas that are difficult to get with a razor. That brings us to shaving. There's just no way around it. If you've got body hair and want it gone, shaving is going to become a daily part of your life. But believe me, I'm exceptionally lazy and I've found ways to work shaving into my routine without dying of boredom or tedium. First off, we've got a product that I really hate having to shout out as it sounds like something from an infomercial, but we've got the Backblade Razor. This thing is sold as a way for people to shave their back hair by themselves and it most definitely works for that. I promise you, as lazy and careless as I am, this thing has never once cut me, and I am pretty careless with it. And it works like a charm. I love this product so much that I use it for more than just my back. Its large shaving head makes it perfect for the chest, stomach, even the arms. I'd keep it away from your face, legs, and bikini area though. This is a brute force tool through and through, and those spots require something a bit more elegant. To that end, I recommend a nice, high quality razor. I use the leaf blade. You just get something like this, a pack of razor blades, and a metal tin to dispose of the blades in, and you're golden. What you want to do is take the razor blade, and while it's still in its wax paper, snap it in half, then attach it to the razor. Change out the blades every five shaves or so, and you'll make the tedious, frustrating process of shaving your legs as convenient and quick as possible. Take your time, be consistent, and soon enough you'll be able to do all of your shaving before your shower runs out of hot water. Personally, I only shave my legs once a week or so, or on date nights. They most definitely get prickly, but putting literally anything over your legs will seriously hide that. Look at how prickly my legs are in this footage. Even super loose fishnets totally distract from the small hairs, and if that's not your style, you can wear any manner of stockings, leggings, pantyhose, whatever you want. However, no matter how practiced and precise you are, I totally understand if you don't want any of these sharp, intimidating objects going anywhere near the especially sensitive areas. To that end, I recommend something like the Philips Norelco One Blade. I've got two of them. Practice with it for a bit before you go diving straight into the danger zones. They also work great on arms and underarms if that's a concern for you. Once you're good with these three products, the back blade, the traditional razor, and the one blade, everything from the neck down will be totally controllable. However, that still leaves your face. This one can be handled a lot more easily than you might think. Now, if you've got surgeon's hands, the absolute best way to get as clean a cut as possible is to use a safety razor, one of these horrifying devices. It takes a lot longer than a normal razor, and I still don't even know how you're supposed to shave your neck with something like this, but hey, maybe you're a full-on shaving enthusiast. Good on you. I, on the other hand, want my daily routine to be as simple as possible, so I recommend getting yourself a foil shaver. I have both a Braun S7 and an S8 so that I can keep one in the car at all times. Most mornings, I will literally just spend about 60 seconds shaving my face and neck while I'm driving, once there aren't any cars close enough to start giving me weird looks. I'm definitely a bit eccentric with it, but I'm someone who basically has to shave her face twice a day, and being able to do that while I'm driving really simplifies my life. It might seem like an unbelievable act of laziness, maybe it is, but twice a day for years? That time does add up. You really don't need your eyes to shave yourself with one of these things. You basically just rub it thoughtlessly around your face and neck until you're satisfied. Using a foil shaver, that is to say one of these ones with the metal mesh on its head, can definitely irritate your skin a bit at first, but after a couple weeks, even the most sensitive parts of your neck will be totally used to it. No red marks or anything. These foil shavers are also perfect if you have trouble shaving your sternum, the hard area between your breasts. It can be tricky to find a razor that fits comfortably in that area, but my two bronze work great for that. The worst part of it all though, the thing that no amount of shaving can fix perfectly for most people, is the upper lip. You can get a slightly better result using a traditional razor rather than an electric foil razor like the Braun S8, but for whatever reason, these hairs are super dark, super deep, and seemingly impossible to handle with shaving alone. Now, with a foil razor, I can get really close so that you don't really notice them unless you're right next to my face, but just about every trans fem I know who hasn't gotten electrolysis or laser up there just uses a bit of makeup on their upper lip. Face masks work great too if you're feeling particularly insecure or if your razor dies on you at the wrong time. As far as makeup goes, I'm really not the person to talk to. I wear lipstick every now and then, and occasionally mascara and eyeshadow, but in terms of that upper lip shadow, you just want to find some basic foundation and color corrector. You might need to shop around a bit to find a shade that matches your skin, so I recommend starting out with the cheaper brands. Then you just need some of these generic makeup sponges. Just put it on your upper lip or any other areas that you want to soften out a bit, like the bags under your eyes or something, and just gently rub it in with the sponge until you're satisfied. Shouldn't take more than a couple minutes once you've got the hang of it. 
However, I can't stress enough that you absolutely need to use a makeup wipe to clean this stuff off before you go to bed. Leaving makeup on overnight will clog your pores and that will lead to acne and grown hairs and uh, just a lot of other skin problems. That's more or less all the wisdom that I have to offer you on hair removal. At a certain point in your hair removal journey, you'll probably come to the same conclusion that I have. You just can't be perfect all the time. I know that it can be annoying and even emotionally painful to have prickly legs or hair messing up your awesome new breasts, but again, you can't be perfectly shaven all the time, at least not without years of tedious, if mostly painless, medical procedures. I know that it isn't the answer that you want to hear, but it's just the way that it goes. A life spent shaving is no life at all. If an area is bothering you especially, just quickly touch it up with a foil razor and get on with your life. Some days you'll want to wear a skirt, but you'll just resign to wearing pants. It's annoying and disheartening, but the key to happiness in all things, shaving included, is to find a practical balance. Dysphoria does start to dissipate with enough time as you start living more true to yourself, and body hair dysphoria has become a practically non-issue for me personally. It'll be different for everyone, but somewhere between shaving for an hour and a half every day and never shaving at all is the perfect target for you to aim for that doesn't take too much effort and doesn't cause too much dysphoria. So figure out where that target is and leave your shaving concerns in the past. Makeup. As I said, I don't really use this stuff too often, and when I do, I usually just feel weird. It's just not my thing. I've got two or so shades of lipstick that I like and some mascara hiding under my car seat somewhere, but beyond that, I'm a little bit clueless. My personal advice would be to not worry too much about makeup. I've got some hair tips in this next section that'll make it a bit less important in terms of hiding the details of your face that you aren't too fond of, but for some advice that's a bit more satisfying, I've brought in our first guest, the smoking hot and masterfully dolled up Adequate Emily. So I'm going to give advice similar to a video I saw when I was first starting out, back when I was 16, 17. Anyway, the video was Transgender Makeup Tutorial by Let's Fly Butterfly. And while that video is 10 years old now, I'd like to tell her if she's watching this, that was a fucking lifesaver of a video for me. But in the service of making a all-in-one service video, I'll take that video's format and expand on it to my regular routine now. So again, don't worry. We won't be getting into the really complicated stuff. Because even I can't really do eyeshadow or eyeliner anyway, so I don't have tips there anyway. We're just gonna focus on a very basic look. We'll avoid eyeshadow, contouring, eyeliner, and even some of the basic stuff I use, like staying powder and primer, just so we can stick to the early, early steps. So we'll start out with foundation. Now, this is really important. Buy foundation that matches your skin tone. For the vast majority of people, drugstore brand foundation will be fine. The issue being that my skin tone is best described as the color most likely to get sunburned. Basically, for 90% of you, you'll find it at the drugstore. If not, just be like me and go to a specialty store like Sephora or Ulta Beauty, but make sure to insist that you have a spending limit of around $20 because they'll try to upsell you. And they're really good at upselling you. And if you do go to a specialty store, you can always have them match your skin type directly. And if not, if you're afraid of buying makeup in public, you can always guesstimate as best as you can online. And while I always default to liquid foundation, and that's the most common, powder works too. Anyway, once you have foundation, grab a makeup sponge, mine looks like this, and then wet the sponge under the sink. Now, wetting the sponge sounds like a very obvious step considering it's a sponge. But I'm clarifying it, because I'll be honest, I didn't know you had to wet it until like a few years ago. I'm dead serious, it's very embarrassing. I thought it sponged up the makeup, like it absorbed a little bit of it. I don't know, I was really dumb. So next you're gonna want to squeeze, but not wring the sponge. Basically what you want is for it to not be wet to the touch, still retain a little bit of water so it's still a little puffed up in size. 
And what you're going to want to do is take some of your foundation and dab it on. I usually use a liquid, so I'll squeeze it onto my wrist here and I'll sort of dab it along the ring of the sponge. To be clear, you do not want to coat the bottom of the sponge. You just want to dab a little bit on it so around this ring is perfect. Again, you do not want to use too much. Just a little ring around this bottom of the sponge is perfect. If you get too much, it'll splash all over you with the next step. To lightly dab it on your face until it's all one even tone. It should basically just look like your regular face, but without any blotches, just one even color. Maybe slightly off from his usual tone, but close enough where it blends in very well. That's basically why the skin tone match is important. So you can just use a little bit of it and it doesn't stand out too much. It doesn't look off. It blends in very well. When it comes to the neck, what I do is I do just the bottom like this and I sort of blend down the neck like this until it fades into the neck. Oh my god, it's weird to be talking while touching your neck. Now, this is maybe a step you don't have to do every time, but you may want to consider grabbing concealer afterwards. So what you're going to do is take a little bit of it, just a little bit on your fingertip, and you can use it to cover up any spots that stand out more under the foundation. So you can do it under the eye if you have under eye bags. And the thing that I hear it really helps out with is if you use a tiny bit of it on beard shadow, it can cover up very well. If, there, if it shines through your foundation, if it's the same tone, this is a lot thicker and it can cover it a bit better. And that can be very useful. Next is blush. I pretty much always use the drugstore brands and most will come with this tiny little brush inside, which is perfect in exactly what you need. Basically take a light brushing of it and then I, what I usually do is I tap it on the side where there's only a little bit left on. Basically it should be just the tippy top of this and it shouldn't be very heavy. It should be very light of a color. And what you do is you lightly brush it on your cheekbones. Just a little bit and then you're done. Just a little bit, just so your cheeks look a little rosy. Nothing more. It's kind of easy and it's something you want to use less of than anything else. And here's a step I suggest. Not everyone suggests this, but I've always really liked this part of my look and I think it's really good for definitely covering up if you're not an expert at things. What I do is I get a nice skin tone finishing powder. This was about six bucks at a drugstore. I always buy this one. It's pretty good. So what you're gonna want to do is grab a brush about this size and take a little bit of the powder and just dust it over your face by tapping the brush until your face has about a light even look that kind of gives it this nice matte finish. It's basically just evens everything out and except for obviously the blush on the cheeks will poke through a little bit more but it'll look a lot like it's an extra version of how your face looks where it's extra cleaned up and nice and even. Now you're almost done and almost at this about, right about this look I have right now, but your final steps include mascara, which is next. What you're going to want to do is take the mascara brush, stick it in between the two layers of eyelashes, but obviously not in your eye. Do not poke your eye out with it. And then just blink on it. Uh, you can typically do it up or down like that if you want to keep your eyes open. But for early stuff, blinking on it typically gets it on anyway. And that's a good beginner technique in a way. And you just try to not get it on your skin. If you do, just grab some makeup wipes and reapply. It's not too much of a hassle. In fact, grab makeup wipes anyway. They're very, very good for a lot of this regular use. Besides, you have to remove the makeup anyway, so wipes always typically the easiest way to do that. Now this is an extra step, but I do it, so I figured I'd include it just quickly anyway, because it's a really easy one, is if you're using foundation, you find out that it sort of makes your eyebrows look a lot less like they're there. Like I've had it like seep into the eyebrows where it just kind of looks very light and weird. 
What I do is I use a little bit of brow filler, and what it does is it makes your eyebrows stand out in a way that they probably typically do on your face anyway. So it just sort of enhances it a bit more from where it would usually be. And it works as you expect. You just use it as a pen. And any mistakes, same thing as the mascara. It's not necessary. A lot of people don't use it. But I do, and it helps me out. And finally, lips. Now this is relatively simple, and it's something you kind of just have to feel out yourself. You just kind of have to trace the shape of your lips till it finds the right shape. You may mess this up a few times, but you just kind of have to feel it out. There, as I said, it's kind of simple in its explanation, but it just kind of has to be tried out. Now the question is, what do you use? Now lipstick, which is what I'm wearing, lip gloss, lip stain, all of that works. But if you want a quick casual look, I recommend a lip colored lip balm. I use this Burt's Bees one, it's a nice maroon, and it feels pretty nice. Just look for the color you're looking for. Pretty much anything you need for your lips can be found at the drugstore unless you're looking for a more wild color, in which case you may have to order that special. And my one recommendation would be to dab with a napkin after applying so that you don't leave stains on everything you touch, you know? You don't want to be leaving lipstick markers on all of your glasses for the rest of your day, you know? And as for your hair, well, I can't give you much specific advice there. Your look is going to be different than mine. If you're going for a long-haired look, then it's often said that your hair will fall into the typical types of curly, straight, or wavy. And that's maybe a bit simplistic. But regardless, try and look for the quality that best summarizes your hair and try to bring it out through your hair care. For me, my favorite quality of my hair that comes naturally is that it's pretty wavy. Though it looks a lot curlier underneath the bright lights of my studio setup. And what I use to treat it is a conditioning spray and a round brush. But there's also straighteners, curlers, it's all about finding what works. My best advice is to experiment. Pay attention to what works, try to take care of your hair in the meantime, and listen to your hairdresser. It's kind of their job to know about this stuff. Oh, and have a lot of brushes. Even if you don't use all of them regularly, having a comb, a wet brush, a regular hair brush, a round brush, you'll probably use all of these at some point, even if only one of them is your regular one. You'll use it for detangling, You'll use it for if you have sort of just something you need to get out of your hair, if it's having trouble staying down. You'll probably use all of these at least once in your life, so you might as well get a bunch of them. They're pretty cheap anyway. And that's again, all just basics. I mean, I couldn't even get into the specifics of hair because I don't know what your hair is going to be like. I'm no expert. But I used to be a lot more scared and confused about all this stuff. and. I felt very alone that I didn't know how to handle it. But now, while I'm not amazing at it, I've improved and I've become someone younger me would be proud of. And you'll be there too one day. Remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint as they say. So that's Emily's word on the topic. You can find her channel linked in the description. She does fantastic film reviews and is a good friend of mine. Now for hair. The first thing to remember is that everybody's got different hair. Me, I've got this especially wavy, dirty blonde hair that not a lot of people really have, so the absolute biggest piece of advice that I can give that applies to almost all hair types is that you can use your hair to frame your face in a way that you like. Personally, I'm a bit insecure about my jawline, the size of my nose and brow line, and the size of my neck muscles, so I keep my hair down to the side, wrapped around the corners of my head so that the shape of my face is in fact just the shape of the hair that I've molded. You can see if I put my hair up in a ponytail that the true shape of my head is revealed. That works fine for some people, but personally I just like to keep it a bit more obscured. As for the nose and brow line, it's simple, just get bangs. Looking online, you see a lot of people talking about how bangs are this high-risk, high-reward strategy for your hair that accentuates all your features on your face, good and bad. 
Well, here's the thing about bangs. They can be as long or as short as you want. Me, I cut my bangs a bit longer than most people so that they cover the top of my brow and my nose and just how sunken my eye sockets are. These aren't hard rules to play by by any means. Some people with sunken eye sockets look absolutely stunning, but that's the fun part of the aesthetic world. You have a lot more control over it than you think you do, and with each degree of control comes an opportunity to express yourself. Have fun with it and try out different things. I know a lot of you don't want to touch your hair right now because you're trying to grow it out as quickly as possible. Well, let me be the first to tell you that doing some light experimentation with a pair of scissors and a comb can do some really good things for you, and there's no shortage of tutorials here on YouTube. Luckily, while a cis woman telling you how she shaves her legs might not be too helpful to us, makeup and hair tutorials are pretty much gender neutral. You don't have men's hair or anything like that, it's just hair and what you do with it is your choice. You can also experiment with some fun glasses if you want to mold your face's impression a bit. Personally, I don't even want to think about the fact that this video is going to force me to be on camera without my normal, entirely superfluous glasses hanging just below my eyes. One other thing, don't be afraid to try out some wigs. I used to wear one myself back when my hair was super short, and I think it looked pretty good, all things considered. They'll give you a chance to experiment without all of the commitment and see what sort of hairstyles you might want in the future when your hair gets longer. Ultimately, everyone's hair is different. I've got particularly wavy hair by default, so what works for me might not always work for you. I'd encourage you to look up some hairstyling tutorials and just try out a bunch of different things. Worst case, you can always wear a hat. It'll grow back sooner than you realize. Now for the fun stuff, and the expensive stuff. I'll tell you right now, if you're just now beginning your transition, you'll have no idea what sort of clothes you'll be wearing in a year. For years, I had in my head a perfect concept of what my style would be if I were a woman, but once I transitioned, I found myself gravitating to new styles on at least a monthly basis. Start out at Goodwill, the cheapest of the cheap, and work your way up as you learn what does and does not work for you. Personally, most of my wardrobe came from a website called Romway. There are some major ethical concerns with fast fashion websites like that. They all rely on extremely inhumane factories. I'll leave the decision of whether to support them to you, but as a young, confused trans woman who most definitely wasn't rich, their absurd and even troublingly low prices made it possible for me to try out all sorts of styles early on and figure out what looked good on me. If you know any women at all, even your own mother, don't be afraid to ask if they've got any hand-me-downs for you either. Experimentation is absolutely essential when you're building a new wardrobe, and experimentation is expensive. Everybody's body is different, and especially if you're on HRT, everybody's body is changing. However, I've got a few fashion tips that I think are more or less universal, and some that are more specific to trans femme people who strive to pass. These are some soft rules, they can be toyed with and experimented around, or even broken completely, but if you want to play it safe, following these rules will make for a good outfit 100% of the time. First off, do not wear clothes that don't fit. That may sound obvious, but realizing that I would be going from a medium in men's to an XL in women's was most definitely disheartening, and so I would constantly catch myself wearing dresses, skirts, or pants that just plain made it difficult to breathe. You always hear the old platitude, beauty is pain. Well, it really doesn't have to be that way. If clothes are uncomfortable, leave them in the store. Whether you're an XL or a double XL or a triple XL, I promise you that you'll look better and healthier in clothes that fit you properly. If you catch yourself unbuttoning your pants when nobody's around, don't wear those pants anymore. It's simple as that. The second soft rule is all about contrast. Contrast comes in two forms. First off, if you're wearing a loose top, wear a tight bottom. If you're wearing a loose bottom, wear a tight top. Again, you don't have to do that with every outfit, but you're really taking your fate into your own hands if you don't. Wearing a sports bra with these harem pants, I'd say this outfit looks pretty natural and complements my body. Wearing that same sports bra with nothing but these short shorts on the other hand makes me look fat. However, if I throw a looser plaid shirt over it, suddenly it's cool again. Now, inversely, if I were to wear these loose pants with this loose top, suddenly every curve of my body has been completely obscured and I look, well, goofy. If I wear tight pants and a tucked in t-shirt, again, I look kind of fat, but if I just tug on the t-shirt a little bit to make it a bit looser while still being tucked in, boom, I look cool again. Again, you don't have to follow this formula for every outfit, but it's a good guideline. There's a reason that most dresses are tight on the top and loose on the bottom. The second form of contrast is color. Light tops, dark bottoms, light bottoms, dark tops. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Going all black is the main exception to this rule, but even that can be a bit too much. The goal here is to look like multiple pieces are working together to make a greater whole. That's literally what it means to look put together. 
Again though, this rule more or less speaks for itself. Let's move on to some more trans femme specific tips. So first off, leggings. Look, if you haven't had bottom surgery, you really should not be wearing leggings without a nice big sweater to cover up the bulge. Tucking is absolutely a thing, but really, I don't care how often you do it or how great your underwear is, it just isn't 100% failure proof. Obviously, this concept applies to a lot of other bottoms too. Just be careful. This isn't even just an aesthetic thing. Keeping your junk low-key is a safety thing too. Moving on, if you're like me, you're a bit insecure about your shoulders. It took me about 10 months of HRT before I was willing to wear tops like this. All I can say is that if you're still insecure about your body, jackets are your friend. Whether it's a cardigan like this, or the classic dysphoria hoodie, or even just a plaid button-up hanging from the sides, jackets can provide sophistication, beauty, cuteness, or punk factor to an outfit, all while helping you feel less exposed. Seriously, a few good cardigans should be part of anybody's arsenal, especially trans femme people. One other area where you might catch yourself feeling exposed is your chest. A whole lot of trans femme people, myself included, have breasts that are just far apart. I'm somewhere around a high A cup, but looking at me straight on, you might assume that I just don't have breasts at all because they're just resting on either side of my torso, watching out for threats from my flank. Well, this makes a lot of tops look a bit strange on me if I'm not wearing a push-up bra. That's where necklaces come in. It can be whatever you want. Personally, I like to wear this penny because that's my name. The point is, even if you've got breasts, some tops just leave you with a wide, flat window right below your neck, and adding a simple necklace can do a lot to distract from that and make you feel less exposed. But that's just a band-aid solution. Let's start talking about bras. Bras are… tricky. If you've got a smaller cup size but a fully grown body, it can be a bit difficult to find something that fits. You go to a department store and all the A or B cup bras are way too small to actually get around your torso. All my friends have recommended that I go to Victoria's Secret or a similar underwear shop to get a bra custom fitted. Well, at my cup size, bras aren't really necessary to begin with, so I haven't bothered going through with the hassle. You might also consider getting some strap extenders for the shoulders. If you're like me, these things just like to fall off of your shoulders, and so rather than pulling up my bra at all times, I usually just put some of these strap extenders on and crisscross my bra straps. That way I can have them wrapped around my back and they don't have any chance of falling off my shoulders. Bralettes are also an amazing option. They look cute even if you've got a totally flat chest, and the sizing is much looser, so unlike standard bras, you won't have to buy a new one every few months as your breasts develop. I'd imagine a lot of you want to know how to bring your breasts closer together, given that so many trans femmes have those classic watching the flank breasts. Well, I do have a solution for that. It's not the most comfortable thing, but it isn't so bad either, and it definitely gets the job done. I mean, remember, I'm only a high A cup, but here I am in this picture. I'll tell you right now that you should probably save this little party trick for special occasions. So this is a strapless adhesive bra. For privacy reasons, I'm not going to show myself putting it on, but basically you just stick it to your breasts and connect it. You can complement it further by putting a normal bra on above it. This makes it dead simple to bring your boobs together and bring out your cleavage. Now the inherent downside is that eventually the adhesive stops working so well and you'll have to replace it. Luckily, they're pretty cheap and can be found at any old Walmart, so it's not too big of a problem. But again, this is more of a party trick than something you should expect to be doing every day. Ultimately though, nothing is going to be able to compete with a bra that simply fits perfectly. It's a little embarrassing that I went so long without doing this. I hardly ever wear bras, mind you. But recently, I got my first handful of bras that weren't from Walmart. <laughs> While there is most definitely a little bit of truth to the idea that trans women tend to have breasts that are further apart, don't think that that means that you won't ever find a bra that fits comfortably. All of those Walmart bras were always so uncomfortable to wear, but for practically the same price, the couple bras that I've gotten from a real clothing store have been like the most comfortable garments I own, and they fit my chest perfectly, as small and far apart as my breasts are. It is 100% worth the time investment to shop around, use the dressing rooms, and get some bras that fit correctly. However, a lot of you probably want to know about stuffing. We've all been there, bundling up socks and stockings to stuff a bra. Well, that was working great for me until the first time I decided to wear that get up to a hookup. Not my wisest idea. They also just look a little bit lumpy and weird. So ultimately, as it was going to take about a year for my HRT to give me breasts of my own, I decided to just bite the bullet and get a fake pair of tits. I don't mean surgery, I mean a literal pair of tits. You can order them from Amazon for about 50 bucks, and what can I say? They basically feel like the real thing, and they look pretty good too. 
Only thing is that you pretty much can't show any cleavage. In fact, your whole chest is gonna look pretty weird if you aren't wearing an outfit that covers it completely like this one would. Some advice I would give is to not worry about using body glue with them. It just isn't worth it. As cool as it felt for me the first time I noticed that I could feel real weight pulling against my skin every time I hit a bump in a car, that body adhesive is a nightmare. It took me about three weeks of intense scrubbing to get all the glue off of my chest and the breast forms themselves. Not a fun experience. Just stuff them in the bra and be done with it. Believe me, it's the best option. Another piece of advice that I'd like to give regarding those breast forms is that if you've never actually had breasts before, you're going to dramatically underestimate how big cup sizes are. I've seen plenty of people with D cups over my life, but good lord they're bigger than they look. I think it's safe to say that I looked a little bit ridiculous with D cups, so just keep that in mind while you're shopping for breast forms. Your breasts should fit your body, and a C cup or a D cup are much larger than you think they are. Alright, I've now written a thousand words about boobs. My job sure does lead me in some interesting directions. Let's talk about dicks. So I'm gonna keep this brief, pun intended, but basically just look up a tucking tutorial. As much as I'd like to give you one here, I think I've given those who want to make out of context videos plenty of ammo so far. Contrary to what a lot of people say, you don't need special gaff underwear or some sort of crazy body tape to tuck. Those things can certainly help if you're into them, but at the end of the day, you can just get tight, secure underwear and your tuck will be secure and comfortable for the most part. Really, tucking is not that uncomfortable, even at first, and you get used to it surprisingly quickly. Just remember that you most definitely don't have to tuck for every outfit. Honestly, it's a once in a blue moon for me thing. One really basic thing to look out for is if you're wearing a loose bottom, like a dress or something, be careful when you're outdoors, walking against the wind. It can make the clothes form against your body in a way that might leave you completely exposed. Honestly, when I'm out and about, I usually just let my purse hang down in front of my crotch, and that basically distracts any wandering eyes. It's a simple fix, but again, I want my transition to be as small a part of my life as possible, and I want to be as lazy as possible throughout the whole thing. And as silly as it may sound when I describe it all beat for beat like that, it's easy and effective. What can I say? Okay, so can I stop talking about my underwear in front of a quarter million people now? Are we all satisfied? Good, let's move on. <sighs> hey, here's a really great tip, not just for trans femmes, but for everybody. Don't become a fucking YouTuber. So whether you're passing perfectly or not, the simple attribute of being trans is going to dramatically change how you interact with the world. You'll probably be getting the occasional weird look from people who think they can determine your gender or lack thereof without just asking. I'm coming from the perspective of somebody who lives in an area where it is relatively safe to be trans. No matter where you live though, your safety is always the number one priority. Get a weapon, whether it's a gun, a taser, a knife, or in my case, pepper spray. Just having a little bit of self-defense and arms reach at all times makes the world a lot less nerve-wracking if you're part of a marginalized group. Personally, I keep a can of pepper spray hanging off my purse at all times. It started out as a trans thing, but by this point it's simply a woman thing. Really, that's the biggest way my social interactions have changed since my transition. People are just plain nicer to me now than they were before. Guys who used to give me funny looks for being such an obvious twink would now practically break their necks to hold doors open for me. Cashiers or waiters that I've never met before have small talk with me all the time, gossiping about their relationships to my impartial ears. People in games are way nicer to me when they aren't screaming about seeing a woman in their TF2 match. I've had guys ahead of me in the line at restaurants literally pay for my food. I even had a girl give me her number completely unprompted at a drive through restaurant once. Other women just casually talk to me about sex or dates gone wrong or makeup and clothes. None of this stuff ever happened to me before my transition. I was hardly even interested in women romantically. But we all know how it goes. Women have their guard higher around men. I do it too. There's no way to say one of the nice things about being trans femme is that women are more trusting of you without it sounding creepy, but these interactions have always been a massive source of euphoria for me, and frankly at this point, I just relate to women more than I do men. A lot of the men that I've got in my life, I love to death, but there's a social itch that I just can't scratch unless I'm hanging out with some other women in my life. It's annoying to talk about gender in such binary and divisive terms, but after a while I realized that I was slowly starting to dissociate from all of those male bonding experience that I had growing up. My memories of sleepovers, playing Halo with friends in middle school, had their context changed a bit. 
all of those memories of my dad saying that's my boy as I was growing up suddenly had this unsettling aura to them. All of the gay experiences that I'd had as a man suddenly felt almost invalidated. I can't even watch my older videos anymore. Like many trans people, my life before my transition just isn't a pleasant subject for me. And that sucks. Sure, gender dysphoria was lurking inside of me through all those years, but it's not like it was all bad. I don't want to feel conflicted about the once rose-tinted memories of my first kiss, or losing my virginity, or all those nights spent hanging out with the boys as a kid. It's just an unpleasant side effect of transitioning and gender dysphoria in general. None of that is fun, but rather than considering it a loss, I've always considered it a trade-off. On the other hand, I got something that very few people manage to get. A do-over. A biological and psychological re-rolling of the dice. Sure, I may have missed out on childhood memories of friendship bracelets and stuff, but I managed to gather all sorts of life experience that other girls didn't have access to as kids, and I had the opportunity to use those experiences to build a better, truer version of myself. Other people see me as the person that I want to be, whether I've introduced myself or not, and I can finally see myself as that person too. It's really frustrating to have to talk so much about the social differences that simply come from presenting feminine instead of masculine, but more than the simple attribute of being trans, changing the gender that other people perceive you as is a huge shakeup to how you fit into social situations. And feeling those differences, as frustrating as they can be, is the purest source of gender euphoria in the world. I remember back when I was a guy, I'd bring boy after boy home with me only for my parents to practically refuse to call them anything but my friend. Never my boyfriend, never my partner, never a fuck buddy. Whether we kissed in front of them or held hands or even if I just walked in and said, mom, dad, this is my boyfriend, they'd always just refer to him as my friend. Well, after my transition, I had this beautiful moment where I brought a boy home with me only to have my dad vet him like crazy, just like how my old girlfriend's dads used to vet me whenever I'd visit their houses as a young fuckboy. <laughs> my parents were being protective of my body and my heart in a way that I would have never experienced had I not transitioned, in the same way that they'd always done so around my cisgender sister. When that eventually gave way to my dad starting to call me sweetheart and saying he loves me every time I left their house, I knew that whether he gets the pronouns wrong every now and then or not, he sees me as his daughter through and through. The same goes for my mother too. I always felt a tinge of ignorance for her. At the start, she'd use phrases like, since you feel this way, or if you're sure you want to be a woman. But after a while, once she'd seen that I was indeed sure, there was this subtle shift. Suddenly, she wasn't talking to me about makeup and clothes just to humor me, but simply because I was another woman she could chat with about woman things. I'm heavily leaning on my parents as an example. I definitely understand that not everyone is as blessed as I am to have a family so accepting and willing to learn, but these same sorts of patterns occurred through my entire social experience. It took people some time to get used to the new pronouns, but without even realizing it, they eventually started treating me like they treat every other woman in their lives. It's awkward as hell for almost everybody involved in first, yourself included, but with enough time, the world loses the old you, and they gain the true you. Believe me though, it is not all sunshine and lollipops. People seeing you as a woman most definitely has its downsides. Creepy old men start hitting on you when you're just trying to get a coffee and some chips. Mechanics assume that you don't know anything about anything. People start assuming that your only ambition in life is folding laundry and vacuuming. Guys start getting handsy or starting to stand way too close to you in lines. All sorts of things like that. To sum it all up, a certain very bold minority of men will assume that since you're a woman, you're just a dumb bimbo who really doesn't understand anything and only exists to make men happy. As I said earlier, my pepper spray started out as a trans thing and now it's just a woman thing. If you weren't a feminist before, seeing what life is like as a woman might quickly convert you. So how do we deal with the negative sides of social femininity? Well, we keep our guard up. No more lonely walks through empty town centers at night. No more leaving your door unlocked. No more showing up to parties without a friend. No more walking alone through night without a personal defense weapon because you parked your car six blocks away. There are people out there who wish you harm, whether it's because you're trans or because they now see you as a woman, and you need to learn how to keep your distance from them. One other thing that can minimize some of the sexual harassment or weird looks is to learn some modesty. 
I know for a fact that a whole lot of us trans women like to seriously overdress. For the love of God, I once wore this outfit to the gas station to get some potato chips and soda and then go home. I'm not saying don't be yourself. Obviously, I'm a really sexual person, and I most definitely dress in outfits that creepy men love. But some situations in life just call for sweatpants and a t-shirt, and believe me, that outfit is much less likely to get you sexually harassed than the choker and knee socks and arm warmers that I see so many trans femme people wearing. Don't let the fear control you or control your style, but if you're having the kind of day where you don't even want to think about men or sex or romance or whatever, maybe just keep it low-key. Another thing, while I personally don't do any clubbing, I understand that a lot of queer people are into that environment, and with the recent tragedy in Colorado Springs, I feel compelled to talk about club safety, so I've sought out some safety tips from people who are more in the know than me, and I actually learned a couple things that I never would have guessed. So first off, we've got the obvious stuff. Never go to a club alone, never go to the bathroom at a club alone, and never let your drink out of your sight. But there are some other, more nuanced tips that I've learned. You should do your best to be visible to any staff at all times, especially security guards or bouncers. And at any club or bar you go to, you should check in with the staff and see if they have any safe word drinks. Apparently, many clubs have a secret code phrase disguised as a drink you can order. And if someone is putting you in a dangerous situation, you can order that drink to covertly make the staff aware, and they'll help you. The woman I spoke with also recommended personally vetting a club before you go there. I'm sure you can learn all that you need to learn by looking at reviews and searching for any headlines involving the club in question. She also warned me that groping is more or less par for the course at clubs, and that it apparently happens a lot more to trans people. So make sure that you understand just what kind of environment you might be walking into. If it sounds like your kind of place, go for it, but places like these do require a bit more vigilance than your everyday fare. Ultimately, all of the information that I've given is from the perspective of someone in the United States. I understand that there are many places in the world that are much less accepting of queer people than my home. There are a whole lot of cultures out there, and so I can't give you many specific details. I would just encourage you to seek out local queer organizations, online groups, and anything else that can safely give you the solidarity you seek and the practical advice for surviving as a trans person in your region. I'd also like to add that you should be aware of the direction your government is moving in. South Carolina, my neighbor state, just had a bill proposed to outlaw informed consent trans healthcare and outlaw all forms of trans healthcare below the age of 25, and worse bills have popped up since I originally wrote this. If you have to move to live the life that you want to live, it's worth it. I'd also highly recommend seeking out trans or queer groups online. I'll have links to some of the good ones in the description. Right off the bat, I know some subreddits that can be really great, and my own Discord server has turned into kind of a really awesome queer space over the years. Everybody there is super friendly. Frankly, it's amazing how little moderation we have to do and how quick my community is to embrace new members. This chapter was long enough to warrant a summary. While there are a ton of social changes you'll experience once you transition and begin to pass with more and more confidence, it can be a very slow process. Passing is a very arbitrary goal, with no clear targets. If you're in a situation where you simply don't feel safe, as painful as it can be, it's my opinion that you're better off boy-moding in public until you can change your circumstances or pass without fail. While transitioning opens up a whole universe of unique life experiences and unimaginable happiness, safety should always be your number one priority. All of that happiness is somewhere out there in the world just waiting for you, and if you need to protect yourself now in order to make sure that you're there to enjoy that happiness in the future, then that's what you need to do. End of story. We've already touched on coming out a fair bit in previous chapters, so I won't repeat myself too much. Instead, I want to focus on a perspective that I can't provide. I was in a situation where my parents and most of the people around me were accepting, but I know that many of us, maybe even most of us, aren't so lucky. So my dearly beloved friend Charlotte has written something up that she'd like me to read for you all, about the unfortunate reality that many of us live, which gives some advice on the troubling topic of staying safe when dealing with parents who would rather you be unsafe than be trans. Being unlucky. It's such a strange way to describe such a unique situation. The misfortune of having friends and family feel disgusted by who you are as a person because they're misinformed or choose to believe it's something that it's simply not. 
It's not new, but it's also something that hasn't gotten easier over time, and dealing with it has been one of the hardest things I've ever had to grapple with. I won't act like I have all the right answers or insight into everyone's lives. I can only truly speak from my perspective and convey my thoughts about it. For the sake of understanding, I should probably give a little context. I've had a very eventful life already. I've had an absentee father, I've had weeks where the only thing I could afford to eat was instant ramen, I've seen my mom beaten into a wheelchair from an abusive stepfather, I've been homeless, I've lost more friends than I can count. To plainly know that these people I hold so close to me and who have shared these horrible experiences with me would react so violently towards me because I wasn't happy with who they perceive me as fills me with a feeling I hold on to more than anything else I've been through. Not because it puts me through worse pain or fear, but because my thoughts on it are so conflicting. These people who would view me as if I had killed their son are the people I love. The woman who's my mom, who up until this point has been my one and only source of comfort, who has flatly said to me that without her children she wouldn't think twice about committing suicide, shortly followed that with a statement with a rant on how all the gays are going to hell and want to destroy Christianity by grooming children, among many other colorful things. The things she says and believes are beyond justification. If anyone else had ever said the things she said around me, I would make them never see it again. Like, in a murder way. This is a joke, don't worry, feds. But it's not that simple. She's my mom, and I can't change that. Despite all her faults, I would never want to bring her or my siblings any pain or worry. However, there will be a point when they know, when it becomes too difficult to hide, or I can't bottle it up and deal with the raw hate. When that happens, I'll need to remind myself that their horrible views aren't my fault, just as it wouldn't be your fault either. Being yourself isn't greedy, and the faults of others are not something you're personally responsible for. The thought of letting go of people we love is gut-wrenching. Sometimes, though, they can be reasoned with, and it might just take time for them to adjust. For others, things will never be the same. Some may threaten or actively commit violent acts. It's okay to leave and be yourself. Your life belongs to you, and your happiness and safety is what's paramount. With cases like these, I do have some advice. First and foremost, when you feel like you're ready to come out but don't believe that you'll be safe, make sure you have a place you can stay. Be it a friend or a cousin's house, your safety is always going to be the highest priority. Before that, you're most likely going to be experimenting with clothing and makeup and maybe some less wholesome things. Over the years, I've found a few places I could reliably hide my clothes and accessories. My go-to place was actually under my bed. Box springs are usually hollow, and putting a dust bag cover that zips open turns it into a container very few people usually think to look in. Floor vents and carpeted rooms are usually loose, and if they're not, it's typically as simple as removing a few screws. If using a vent, don't store makeup or perfume in there, though. A vent's job is to bring in hot and cold air, which can ruin some makeup and will make the room smell like its contents. In addition, wrap clothing in something that would protect it from dust. I'm sure Penelope already has a list of resources for femme clothing and stuff. She's smart like that, not my words, hers. But if receiving these things through the mail could out you, I highly suggest renting a P.O. box if you're near a post office. It's usually a small fee, but it's safe and you can order a wide variety of things safely through it. As much as I hate supporting Amazon, the company has public lockers free for anyone to order through. It's safe, convenient, and it gives you several days of leeway to pick up any items. The fact that you're here, right now, in this moment, is worth being proud of. Taking the time to look into exploring who you are as a person is arguably the biggest step. You're beautiful, you're loved, and every time a person like you takes strides towards being their true self, the world becomes a brighter and warmer place. Thank you, Charlotte. It's a very real possibility that when you come out, you'll lose a couple of friends who simply can't accept you for who you are. It's painful, I know. I lost two friends to my transition, people I'd known for years, simply because they were too close-minded or too indoctrinated by senseless hate to see my happiness. All that they could see was a confused person who was asking way too many questions. In reality, my transition was the moment I stopped asking questions, and for the first time in my life, started giving answers. None of that makes it any easier to lose someone who's close to you. All I can say is that it's a big world, and every single one of us has a place within it. Yes.
Let's move away from all of these extremely heavy topics and talk about something that's much less fatalistic. Voice training. Now, I'll tell you right now, this is the most abstract part of passing by far. In my head, my voice has hardly changed at all. You all have no idea how insecure I get about my voice here on this channel, where I do nothing but speak to you all. I still don't think my voice passes, but other people seem to. I constantly get called ma'am and whatnot over the phone, and I've now stopped getting weird looks when people hear my voice after seeing my face and body, so I guess I've made some progress. My point here is that it's just about impossible to tell whether or not you've hit your goals with your voice. Being confident in your voice is something that simply has to come from time spent using that voice. However, I've got some tips to at least get you on the right track. You might watch the obligatory trans voice lessons videos and do your practice and all of that, but what's helped me more than anything is watching female YouTubers. It sounds strange, I know, but given that the vast majority of popular YouTubers are men, you might not realize how much time you spend surrounded by masculine voices. Simply by watching channels like Strange Eons, Chad Chad, Illuminati, Jenny Nicholson, and so on, you'll subconsciously pick up on some minor things you can do with your inflection to give a feminine vibe to your speech. Funnily enough, once you start watching channels like these regularly, YouTube will start recommending you more and more female content creators. I'm sure you'll find some that you love with a bit of searching. I know I have. Secondly, as the people around you start to see you for who you are and treat you more and more like they treat other women, it'll feel natural to talk to them with a little bit more of a feminine voice. Now, when I'm playing TF2 with the boys, I've noticed that at some point I started perceiving myself relative to them. The dynamic shifted a bit when I started to focus on the things that made me different from my friends, mainly my boobs, and so it started to become subconscious. I didn't have to keep in mind that I was a woman. The new voice just slowly started to become my default voice, and now I don't even think about it anymore unless I'm on camera like this. That's what it all boils down to, making a feminine voice your default state. It's easier than it sounds, in fact it'll happen automatically with enough time, but it really does just take that, a lot of time. Just don't give up. If you've been practicing for a few weeks, you probably won't even realize how much progress you've made, but you'll have already come a long way. However, for some more practical and less abstract advice, let's hear a word from our next guest, Ziana from Trans Voice Lessons. Hi there, I'm here to help you with the vocal side of things in transition. So first off, not everyone that transitions feels a need to change their voice. So if that's you, that's totally fine. However, for individuals who are suffering from vocal dysphoria or who want to modify their voice to better blend in the way that they're looking for, voice modification can be extremely effective and extremely powerful. And dare I would say empowering. I think most people come into this process and they think about the idea of changing their voice as almost daunting or confusing or scary. And I, I definitely understand that, but I really encourage people to think about it differently. Voice modification, in my opinion, is one of the most empowering aspects possible in transition because it's something that completely comes from us and it's something that we are in control of. It's a more direct way of self-actualization. You know, when we take hormones, we have to wait a bunch of time and we're at the mercy of genetics. And when we get a surgery, we have to wait and, and we have to rely on the surgeon. And there's just a lot of things in transition that we are in complete direct control over. But our voice, we have control over. And not only that, everyone's voice is so incredibly malleable. We all have an intuitive capability to learn how to modify voice. We learn how to speak an entire language basically on our own as a baby. So if you are just getting started in the process, what should you be doing? Well, honestly, if you're a beginner getting started on voice modification, the most important thing you can do at first is to be vocal. Explore your voice. Go to higher pitches, go to lower pitches. Try heavier sounds, try lighter sounds. Look at different resources on the internet. But regardless of what actions you're actually doing, you just need to be vocally active. Most individuals come into this process with a lack of basic vocal coordinations that enable greater freedom early in the process. So even if you're uncertain about what you should be doing, simply exploring and playing with your voice is going to create a very fertile ground for other things to come into the process and create more impact later on. But unlike many other aspects of transition, we are in control of our voice. And since it's such a profound influence over how people perceive us, 
to me, that's extremely empowering. One of the most powerful things that we have at our disposal and our transition is something that we have control over. And of course, if you're working towards feminization initially, you'll primarily want to start with your sound production, working on getting a little bit higher, a little bit lighter, making sure the sound production is clean and balanced, making sure you're able to fluidly speak through it without sounding stilted or jagged. These are basic fundamentals that you'll want to start to lay down as a foundation in order to scaffold the rest of the components on top of. And of course, if you're working towards masculinization, you'll initially want to work on exploring your low end, working on increasing your weight a little bit, the opposite of feminization in many cases. So I hope this is helpful. And I just really want to reiterate that I have seen hundreds and thousands of people go through the process of voice transition. And if there's one thing that I can relay, it's that your capacity to change your voice is so enormous. I have seen people with the lowest of low traditional voices get into completely average and above average feminine voices and vice versa in masculinization. You simply don't know what your capability is or your potential is until you really give it your all and you explore your voice in full. Voice is like any other habit, so it will take some time to change, but as long as you are diligent and persistent, I have absolute confidence you'll be able to achieve your goals. Bye. Hopefully Z's tips can help you out in your voice journey. I'd really recommend watching her channel if you want to learn more. I know that it's an abstract target that you're aiming for, and you might not even understand what progress looks like when it comes to your voice, but whether you practice regularly as Ziana encourages, or just sort of float downstream like I tend to, you'll get there eventually, I promise. So now for the big one. You've gotten all sorts of clothes, you've developed a style, you've mastered tucking, and with your new voice you could topple the plutocracy with a single longing sigh. But when do you get your tits? Well, that's where hormone replacement therapy, or HRT, comes in. More than anything else in this video, HRT is subject to the classic stipulation of your mileage may vary. For one, everybody, regardless of their assigned sex or hormones, has a genetically predetermined breast size. The same goes for your hips and your ass and all that other stuff. Even if you've never taken estrogen, you've got a cup size, your body just doesn't have the tools to get you there yet. All of the women in my family have smaller breasts, so I doubt that I'll be getting much further than a B cup. Upping my estrogen or progesterone or lowering my testosterone won't change the maximum size that my breast could get without gaining substantial weight or getting a surgery. So hey, if you haven't gotten HRT, take some pleasure in knowing that you do have a cup size, but your body's just gonna need a bit of extra help to get you there. On top of that though, every one of us is just plain different. After years of smoking, I'm at a bit higher risk of blood clotting than most people, so I'm stuck using these annoying patches to get my estrogen, whereas an identical clone of myself who'd never smoked would be able to use shots or pills or whatever she wanted. We all have different HRT regimens that work best for us. I recently added progesterone to my regimen to try and make my breasts a bit less pointy, and it's been working great for me so far. However, my doctor warned me that plenty of trans femme people experience only the negative side effects of the hormone, no breast development and a heightened irritability. The same goes for estrogen. While the satisfaction rate is much higher than progesterone's, estrogen doesn't have consistent results either. It took me about six months on estrogen and testosterone blockers to see any breast development whatsoever, and it wasn't until about nine months in that I had unambiguous tits and it took about 11 months for my hips to start filling out. Meanwhile, I've seen plenty of trans people see major changes in their first six months. I think that consistently, you can expect some emotional changes pretty early on. I found that all of my emotions, the good and the bad, were heightened, whereas before HRT, I felt completely numb to most things. For that reason, I consider HRT to be my antidepressant. These new emotions of mine have connected me to the world within and without myself in a way that I had never been before. It's not the most satisfying answer I know, but at the end of the day, all you can do is get your prescription, ask your healthcare provider as many questions as you can think of, and then just see where the road takes you. Believe me, the satisfaction rate for trans HRT patients is extremely high. You can also check out subreddits like r slash trans timelines if you want to get a better sense of what you can expect. As for what all can change in your body, there's really a lot to look forward to. Breasts and hips are the most obvious part, but you can also look forward to the possibility of body hair starting to thin out, although you almost definitely won't stop growing body hair. 
your ass might get fatter, your thighs thicker, your muscles might start to change, giving you less broad shoulders and a less thick neck. Even the shape of your face can change subtly. All of my old face masks have started sliding off of my face recently. I've also recently started progesterone, which I know is getting more and more popular as a trans HRT medicine lately. So far, my breasts have gotten less pointy, and I've been a lot more tired throughout the day. I've also fallen under the spell of boy smell, and I tend to be a bit more irritable. Overall, I'd say it's working great for me. However, according to my doctor, a lot of patients try it for a week and then instantly put it away. Progesterone just isn't a very well-researched hormone in regards to gender-affirming care, and many patients experience only the negative side effects. I'd recommend just taking estrogen and testosterone blockers at first so that when you do start progesterone, you can tell where the effects of one end and the others begin. Or if you want to go further with it, you could start with monotherapy, taking either estrogen or testosterone blockers. Many people simply don't need tea blockers, so that can be another thing to talk to your doctor about. Also, because I've seen so many people talking about it, as far as my doctor knows, there's essentially no benefit to taking your progesterone rectally. I've heard accounts saying that it massively increases the effectiveness of progesterone, and other accounts saying that it's practically the same. Many doctors in this field unfortunately rely on pretty outdated information, so use progesterone rectally at your own risk, and research the concept thoroughly. All of our bodies develop at different speeds, but there's an extremely high probability that if you've made it this far into the video, HRT is a good option for you. Like anything else, safety is key, so just make sure you talk to a doctor first. But how do we actually get a doctor? Well, in the United States, at least most of the United States, we're lucky enough that it's about as easy as it could possibly be. Call up your local Planned Parenthood office or visit their website, book an appointment, and you'll have your medicine in no time. In my case, I had to wait about three days for a telehealth appointment, basically a Zoom meeting, where I had an hour-long meeting with a kind woman, and later that day, I was picking up my first doses of estrogen and testosterone blockers from the pharmacy. Over the first year, I had to check in with Planned Parenthood in person every three months so that they could take blood samples and measure my hormone levels and see how my body was reacting to the treatment. After a year of being green across the board, I now only have to go in every six months. I'd also highly encourage you to seek out local queer organizations. The communities also put together a map showing a whole lot of informed consent clinics that you might find success from, although I will say it's almost entirely focused on the United States. Link in the description. As for other places, where getting trans medical care requires years of wait lists, doctors that don't follow the rules, or it simply isn't possible through official channels, I'll have to refer you to DIY HRT, do-it-yourself hormone replacement therapy. All that I can say is that this isn't necessarily the safest thing in the world. You should absolutely be getting blood tests every three months just like I do and cross-referencing your results with those of a patient who is receiving above-the-board trans HRT in a more progressive area. As for how you actually get the medicine, many people borrow it from friends or have it delivered to them from online. I'd recommend looking into DIYHRT.wiki. For about a million reasons, chief among them being that you all live in different places with different laws, it's impossible for me to refer you to anything more specific than that. The number one thing to keep in mind is that if you choose to go this route, you're going to need to be your own doctor, and you have to act like it. As tempting as it may be to double your dosage in hopes of seeing faster results, you need to do everything by the book. Get your blood tested and get the results back for yourself. Do your research and always play it safe. For my own safety, I'd like to clarify that I'm not accountable for anything that happens if you go the route of DIY HRT. If you live in one of those areas with criminally underbaked infrastructure for trans healthcare, I'll also refer you to a video from PhilosophyTube. I emailed my doctor 133 times, the crisis in the British healthcare system. While that video doesn't spend too much time talking about ways of bypassing the whole mess, it might do you some good as a way of venting your frustrations and knowing that you're seen. Let me be the first to tell you that surgeries are not a requirement for being trans or for passing or anything of the sort. There's absolutely nothing invalidating about being a woman with a penis. However, I'm sure plenty of you still wish you didn't have one, or you want to have a butt lift, or facial feminization surgery, or breast augmentation, or whatever else. Personally, I don't plan on ever having any gender-related surgeries, but that's just my personal preference. Part of the fun of transitioning is that you have a lot of decisions to make, and with them, a lot of freedom to wield. 
While I personally haven't had much interest in surgeries, the number one thing I've seen on message boards and such is that you want to seriously vet the ever-living hell out of the doctors that you're going to choose from. It's better to spend $1,000 flying somewhere to get a surgery from a reputable professional who's loved by the trans community than to wind up getting medical work done locally that won't be as good as it could otherwise be. However, ultimately, I'm not the person to talk to about this stuff, so I've brought in one last guest speaker for this video, my fellow trans woman and my fellow Star Trek nerd, Jessie Gender. Hello, thank you so much for having me be a part of this video. I'm super honored. Um, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Jesse Gender. Some of you may already be aware of uh, my other channel where I'm that weird Trekkie dork who talks a lot about Star Trek and other nerdy and geeky things, as well as transgender and LGBTQ focused issues. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, gender affirming surgeries and the surgeries that I specifically have had. So, um, I've actually in my lifetime had three gender affirming surgeries over the past 10 years or so. So I've had vaginoplasty, the, the downstairs one. I had breast augmentation, got these, these honkers right here as you see me fondling myself. Uh, and then I had facial harmonization surgery, sometimes known as facial feminization surgery, literally, uh, I wanna say about six months ago. So within the past year. Uh, and actually you can still see my, my jowls are still a bit swollen. Uh, you see all this little extra swollen face fat going on there. And I wanna just say right up front, having been a trans woman who has had all these surgeries, that none of these surgeries make you more or less transgender. Gender. Every trans person's journey within their own gender, their own body, what they desire to change about their body or not change about their body is their own. Uh, and so you could have a billion surgeries if you want to, you could have no surgeries and that doesn't invalidate you or validate you in any way, shape or form. It's all about what you want for yourself. The opportunity to discover that and learn about that is actually a joy. Everyone is on their own journey and I think that that's amazing. But to like talk about each surgery specifically, uh, like I said, I've had these surgeries over the past decade or so. Um, and I had the vaginoplasty first because that was the one that was sort of most present of mind and was the part of my body that I was most dysphoric about. That surgery was really, really difficult uh, in that like there was just a lot of nonsense and bureaucracy to to prove that uh, that, that this is something that was going to be good for my mental health something that i wanted and, and it's something that you see a lot in the uh trans uh medical community know that there might be a lot of stigma um, and that is something that i definitely encountered a lot in my journey and vaginoplasty was sort of the biggest one that i encountered that within and recovery, as with all of these surgeries, uh, but for vaginoplasty specifically, was a lot like I couldn't sit down really well for about a year. Um, and that was um, that was kind of uh, scary and difficult. I mean, any surgery is gonna be difficult to heal from. Um, and it was numb in places, it hurt in others. And that's kind of scary for an area that's supposed to be like something that you use every day and then also is a area that you hope to find pleasure in, especially after having gone through a surgery like this. And I will say, while keeping it kind of PG-13, that um, after, several years after the surgery, I am very happy with my decision. Um, I am able to get a lot of pleasure down there. It worked perfectly fine. Uh, and I, I'm, I, I think the biggest thing with that, honestly, beyond just the fun parts, is just the feeling of congruence, getting to see myself and like wear underwear or swimsuits in and not have to worry about that part of my body. I don't know, it just, it, it's just nice to not be worried about it. Like this used to be an ever present thought in my mind. And as of the past few years, it's just something I don't think about anymore. It's just me. Um, the other two, like I said, that I had were breast augmentation and facial harmonization surgery, sometimes known as facial feminization surgery. But that was, surgery was the one that was probably easiest to recover from. I mean, it's not an easy surgery. I mean, no surgery is easy, but it was certainly one that like I was recovered from after a few months. And I was very pleased with the results. Uh, like they're, they're fun. <laughs> they're fun to look at, but also again, it sort of fit that body congruence as well. Facial harmonization surgery uh, was one that uh, I've chronicled on my own channel. Uh, I did a whole video where I sort of spoke about my feelings on it. If you want to check out that video, I'm really proud of it. I will say that that was the surgery, even more so than the vaginoplasty, that was like the hardest one to recover from. With facial harmonization surgery, you like swell up like a balloon. And like, I couldn't see for a few days. I'm still healing months later, but I'm really happy with the result. And again, it's just one of those like weird moments where you look in the mirror and you're like, that's my face? That's who I am now? Yeah, and this feels good. And that just like, growing sense of pleasure and, and happiness and joy at your own body in a way that you never had before. It's just so nice. I really do think it is just a beautiful evocation of the journey of humanity. And so all of that is kind of what I 
wish I knew going into surgery is that this was a big journey. It's a rough journey. It's a hard journey. There's going to be a lot of stigmas and, and things that you're going to have to think about your own self um, going through it all. But at the end of the day, I think it is a beautiful thing. But within that, you still have to face a lot of stigma and doctors that you're going to uh, have to find a lot of the time uh, who, who can perform these surgeries. And I think vetting them, I think, takes a lot of like going on their websites, learning a lot about them, calling them, speaking to them. Uh, I think getting a chance to be in the room with them and seeing how they feel about trans people I think is also very important for me. Uh, my breast augmentation doctor being a little bit weird was fine for me considering how more um, ubiquitous the breast augmentation surgery was as compared to more trans specific surgeries like facial harmonization and vaginoplasty. But for those two surgeries, I definitely wouldn't have wanted a doctor that was much more reticent around trans people because those are very trans specific. So you want a doctor who is going to be very welcoming and affirming. But in terms of vetting them, like look online, speak to trans people. There are many communities in like Reddit that are very good about being open about their experiences with doctors. So if you want to look up a doctor, look to the trans community to ask questions. And so that's some things to think about when you're picking a doctor. I'll end on this words of encouragement. Know that you are beautiful no matter what. A surgery does not validate your identity. It only allows yourself and the world to see the real you better. But really, at the end of the day, any way that you get to express yourself and show yourself to the world is amazing and beautiful. So you will encounter roadblocks and, and setbacks if you're wishing to pursue these surgeries, um, and that really sucks. But do not ever feel like you are never going to be your full self without a surgery because you already are beautiful and amazing. And these surgeries, if you want them, um, can only help enhance that. They can only help enhance um, us being able to see your beauty even more. Um, and I'll end on that. She's right, you are beautiful. Ultimately, it's your body to do what you want with. Nobody has any right to tell you that you should get a cosmetic surgery, and nobody has any right to tell you that you shouldn't. Unless, of course, there's an underlying health issue preventing you. I won't say whether you should or should not get surgeries. All I can say is that whatever you choose to do, it's not a decision to be taken lightly. Lucky for you, you've got all the time in the world to consider it. I remember several months ago, before I started taking my caloric intake more seriously, within healthy margins of course, I was feeling bad about my hip to waist ratio when an extremely kind friend of mine saw a picture of me and told me that I had a really cute pear-shaped body type. I don't really know how true that is anymore now that I'm losing weight and my hips are starting to fill out, but as strange a lesson as it is to learn at 23 years old, hearing somebody be genuinely positive about something other than an hourglass figure had a surprisingly profound effect on my perception of beauty. See, everybody on Earth has been affected by unrealistic beauty standards in one way or another. All of our favorite celebrities and influencers airbrush their pictures or take two dozen selfies before finding one that they want to post. Magazines and TV shows all showcase models wearing ridiculous amounts of makeup or photoshopping out their more human features. Hell, even I use a digital skin smoothing filter in my videos. I'll toggle a lot for the rest of this segment just so that you can see what I'm talking about. It's simply impossible to look at the social media presence of an attractive person and not start judging yourself in unhelpful ways. Whether you're a woman, cis or trans, a non-binary person, a cis or trans man, or anything else, we all feel the weight of beauty standards from time to time. Let me go on record saying that that is complete bullshit. I know it's never as simple as saying, just don't let it get to you. I know that it isn't very encouraging to say, you don't have to pass to be beautiful. And I know that platitudes like, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, don't do a thing for a fragile self-esteem. However, there is no love more powerful than self-love. And learning self-love is incredibly important for everyone in the world, especially trans people. For a time, I was growing incredibly impatient waiting for my body to start filling out on HRT. But I eventually hit a point where I was able to look past my self-image issues on a day-to-day -day basis and just start enjoying being the person that I was and having the body that I had. I'm not going to lie and say that I don't wish I had a skinnier waist and smaller arms, but changing your body, whether done surgically, hormonally, dietarily, or any other way, is always going to be a slow process. It's always going to require a lot of patience, and if you can't learn self-love, you'll never have that patience. So how do we learn self-love? Well, there are a lot of ways. Ultimately, it's a personal journey, and you'll need to find what works best for you. Some things that have helped me have been, as I said earlier, dressing for my body. Just simply refusing to wear clothes that are too tight to be comfortable has worked wonders. 
Changing my diet to stay roughly at a calorie deficit has given me a lot of hope for the future and made me less bothered by the present. Finding simple, low-key fits that aren't much more convoluted than a tank top and sweatpants has helped me feel a lot less judged and ogled at as I roam the earth. Learning simple, reliable methods of shaving and all the other parts of my daily routine have also helped a ton. Really, everything I've touched on in this guide, and much, much more, can all play a role in self-love and self-acceptance. Everybody talks about how once they go trans femme, they're suddenly confronted with a world of sexual harassment, but we never talk about the other obstacles that we find ourselves facing, the world of beauty standards. There are methods to overcome that world, but ultimately, it's simply on you to discover them. So now, as we approach the end of this video, we get into the more fun stuff, or at least the area where the fun stuff is the primary motivator. Believe me, there's a lot of bad that comes with this topic too. If you're anything like me, then your transition will act as a re-roll of your sexuality. I always identified as a bisexual man before my transition. I would sort of flip-flop between which gender I wanted to be most involved with, but most of the time I was seeking men. After my transition, I found myself asking a lot of questions about my sexuality. I initially thought that while I'd previously had a lot of great experiences dating women, now I'd be gutted to see a cis woman naked. I was so insecure in my own body that the thought of being intimate with someone who doesn't have to work so hard for it would send me spiraling down a vortex of dysphoria. I made up monsters in my head, thinking that I'd be forced into a masculine relationship role, or that if people saw the two of us together, they'd assume that I was a man. See, I'm still bi, just like I was before my transition. The only difference is that the imposter syndrome that we all deal with every now and then, well, it used to make me afraid of women, as funny as that sounds. I'm over that now, though. I'd say that my bisexuality is more same-gender leaning now, i.e. I feel more attracted to women now than I do men. I do feel a tinge of pain whenever I think about the fact that, while I've been with women before my transition, I've never had a proper lesbian interaction. It's like a piece of my femininity that's just missing. So my advice would be to not settle down into a relationship so early into your transition. Give your sexuality time to breathe. Changing genders is a big shakeup to things in that department, and it does warrant some more experimentation. If you're newly transitioned, you might share that same dilemma that I used to have, women attracted and women intimidated. But that'll pass, believe me. And you don't want to miss out on exciting life experiences because of a single year or less of trepidation. On to some more universal advice. Flirting. How do I make myself enticing as a woman using only words and a bit of body language? Well, look, it's cliched advice, but just be yourself. Whether you're a top, a bottom, a switch, a man, a woman, non-binary, agender, straight, gay, whatever, you should look at yourself, recognize what you're trying to sell, and learn how to sell it with confidence. As far as romance goes, I'm something like a power bottom, so when I'm flirting, I just make playful allusions to the other person's strength, masculinity, desires, whatever. I've got a lot of trouble with other people being wet rags when flirting, so at a certain point, I decided to just stop with all the subtlety. If I like you, I'm probably showering you with affirmations and talking about my sexual preferences without framing it as a joke, and saying things like, oh god, I bet you could bench press me. Look, we live in the age of TikTok and YouTube shorts, vine thuds, and red circles. It's getting harder and harder to keep someone's attention, so quit being coy and just focus on selling the experience of you to the people you're attracted to. Of course, selling the experience of you is something that requires a lot of self-confidence. I've lived by this idea for as long as I can remember, but for the love of God, get some hobbies. I don't care who you are, nothing is less attractive than a person who's got nothing going on outside of you. Frankly, we've got a name for that. People who would rather wait on you to tell them what they should do with their free time. We call them simps. If you've got nothing going on in your life, then what the hell are we supposed to talk about? Am I just meant to feel bad every time I'm doing my own thing and pursuing my own goals because I'm not entertaining you? There's simply no way to be an interesting person if all you do is sit on a computer playing the same two games all day every day. That, more than anything else, makes you undateable. The same goes for people whose only passion is drinking or getting high. Have you ever tried to flirt with a stoner? It's the most infuriating thing in the world. I don't care how many bongs you have, tell me about something interesting that happened to you today. Well, the same goes for stay-at-home gamers and anyone else who isn't participating in their world. This is esoteric advice, and I'm probably just venting right now more than anything, but this is what people mean when they say that they need to work on themselves before they get into dating. 
Having hobbies at the end of the day increases your self-esteem, which makes you better at flirting, period. It makes you more interesting, which makes you better at talking to people, and ultimately, I'd be willing to go so far as to say that it's practically impossible to get in a long-lasting, healthy relationship if you don't value your own free time. So, to a lot of you, I just went over the fundamentals of romance without any allusions to the trans perspective on the topic. The reason I went that route is because really, at the end of the day, flirting is still flirting, no matter who you are. It might take you a bit to figure out what experience it is exactly that you're trying to sell people, but once you've got that figured out, the rules of romance don't really change at all. Men, women, and everyone else have these same pressures and expectations put on them when trying to flirt. Surprisingly, it isn't really something that you have to relearn. Being trans does come with a few caveats when it comes to dating, though. The number one rule of all is to watch out for chasers. If it's just a hookup, whatever, have fun, but a chaser is someone who fetishizes a minority group, in our case, trans people. If a person only wants you because you have a girl dick, that's an immediate red flag and you should drop them as soon as you can. Having a genital preference is one thing. If you're a cisgender straight man who has a genital preference towards vaginas, that does not make you transphobic or super straight or whatever. Likewise, being a cisgender straight man with a genital preference towards dick does not automatically make you a chaser or gay or whatever. A chaser does one thing more than anything else. They objectify people. If you feel objectified, just fail. It's as simple as that. Secondly, and this applies to all dating for queer people, do be careful with public displays of affection. Maybe it almost never comes up for you, but if you're in a place where you're getting bad vibes, maybe don't lean on your boyfriend's shoulder or hold his hand until you get back in the car. Simply put, hate crime is rampant. The gay panic defense and the trans panic defense are still applied in a ton of US states, and as always, safety comes first, even if it's over something so stupid. Hey guys, odds are pretty decent that you just skipped this section of the video as soon as you saw the chapter title. Well, I don't know what exactly your motivations in doing that are, but you should probably put your dick away. This chapter isn't going to be steamy or romanticized, it isn't even going to be funny to anyone who's ever actually had sex. I'll be honest, I could really just direct you all to this one design I know about called f***ing trans women, which can be found on archive.org. It's a really great read, a self-described cookbook for sex with trans women, but I understand if it's a bit much for some people. All I can say is that you've got a lot more g-spots than you might think. Look, I'm gonna keep this direct and to the point. A lot about your headspace, preferences, and everything else changes when you transition. Experiment a lot. Communicate desires or concerns clearly with your partners, especially those who are uninitiated with trans femme people. Don't be afraid of any part of your body. Nothing about it is invalid, and all of it is beautiful when wielded with confidence. One other thing, um, expect to spend a few months practicing before you can do that thing that a lot of people with dicks are gonna want you to do without hurting yourself a lot. My best advice in that department would be to breathe and let yourself relax. It'll take some getting used to for both yourself and your partners, and maybe a bit of trial and error, but it can be an amazing experience if done properly. Use lube. Above all else, just remember that sex is meant to be a mutual thing. Maybe you enjoy pleasing others, but don't let your partner ignore your own needs. Oh, and if you're with someone who's able to get pregnant, go to your doctor and figure out whether or not you're able to make that person pregnant. Testosterone blockers don't just instantly make you infertile overnight. Get some tests done before you make any assumptions. And on that same note, if someday you want to have kids that you do share blood with, I would highly encourage you to freeze some sperm at a sperm bank before you go into HRT or anything like that. Lastly, let's talk about hookups for a minute. They're weird. Expect a lot of following people down an apartment building hallway into dark rooms. It most definitely can be as dangerous as it sounds. Personally, I've had hookups end in me literally calling Child Protective Services. I'm not going to tell any of you not to do hookups. It can be fun, but there are a couple key safety things that you absolutely have to do. First off, you want to send each other selfies where you're holding the other person's name written on a piece of paper. Then, even if it's embarrassing, or your friends are prudish or whatever, you want to send those two images to a trusted friend and tell them that you're going to this location at this time for a hookup. The same goes for just dates from apps like Tinder. Even if the other person has ill intentions, doing these things will deter them. As with everything else in this guide, staying safe is the key. To everyone else, i.e. those who are or plan to be involved with a trans femme person, chasers who want to get some intel, or shit posters who think this whole video is nothing but fuel for memes, I'll give you some good advice to take home with you regardless. If you're in bed with a trans woman, don't treat her dick like you would treat a guy's dick. It just isn't the same, and if that doesn't make sense to you, talk to her.
she'll be glad that you did. Before we wrap this thing up, I want to remind you that I've got a bunch of additional resources listed and labeled in the description below this video. Both resources that I knew about prior and that various trans people or queer people have brought to my attention. While this video has been peer-reviewed by both trans women and non-binary trans femme people, and has involved a bunch of collaboration with other trans figures, being trans is not some universal experience. We all experience the world differently, so if you feel that your perspective or circumstances weren't represented in this video as much as you would have liked, I hope that some of these additional resources in the description will be a bit more helpful to you. Over the course of this video, you probably caught yourself thinking, good lord, do I really need to know all of this stuff? Well, so much of what's been presented here is stuff that you kind of gradually pick up on as you go about your day-to-day post-transition. The goal of this video was never to instantly give you a couple years of life experience. This guide isn't a step-by-step -step tutorial for anything. It's more of a compilation of tips. The hardest part of transitioning is that when you first start, there are so few resources. It's so difficult to find the answers for those weirdly specific questions that you don't know how to ask. You don't even know what you should be trying to do when you first start out. That's why I created this field guide. Not to instantly transport you to the much more stable, confident person you'll be in a couple of years, but to hold your hand and help you walk down that path at your own pace. Hopefully now you at least know what your life is going to look like as you settle into your transition. Hopefully now you know what sort of things you can start aiming for. As always, my DMs are open if you have some questions or want some advice. I can't get to everyone, and I most definitely don't know everything, but for what it's worth, I'm more than happy to play the big sister every now and then if it'll help somebody be more confident in themselves and comfortable. My Discord's the best place to reach me. There's a link to the server in the description. Plenty of amazing people there that will welcome you with open arms. Aside from that, you've got my Twitter and Instagram, also in the description. Just remember, there are people who don't want you to be yourself. There are biological hurdles that you'll have to overcome. You simply have to work harder to look how some people get to look for free. You have to work harder to have a sense of self in which all of the puzzle pieces fit together. So much of transitioning is focused on the body, but words cannot describe how amazing it feels to have a mind that's congruent with itself. That can be earned. It can be worked towards. So, while it may often feel like you've got everything in the world working against you, you're human. And as a human, you have one very important power. You have the power to be yourself, regardless. Before I close out today's video, I'd just like to take a minute to thank everybody who made this project possible. Obviously my patrons, I'll be reading out the names of the $10 patrons as usual, but also Zach and Charlotte who have been so supportive over the course of this video's production, and just all the real shit that's been happening in my life over the last three months that I've been working on this, and just all of my viewers who have been so patient with me. I promise that we'll be back to the normal stuff, this is not going to become like a trans focused channel. As I said, these last three months have been fucking insane. Over the course of producing this video, I went through a breakup, I realized that I'm probably gay, and just everything else in my life has been equally hectic. I'd also like to thank the other content creators who helped contribute to this video, Adequate Emily, Jesse Gender, and Trans Voice Lessons, Ziana. 
getting to work with people who I respect so much has really eased my tensions while making this video. The whole time I kept on thinking that this whole project was very pretentious, which maybe it is, but whatever. But being able to see names that I've respected for so long being involved with this has really just made my heart happy. But anyways, it's time for me to list those patrons' names. Isla Scott, Cappy, Solaris, Lake, Mina, Trash Cam Teddy, Super, Sky, Even Knight, Panda, Mr. Kokoko, Shay Theus, Gab, Swatchbox, Nomad Delilah, Cass, Staley, Bjorb, Lily Leones, Neris, Michaela, Franz Johannes Fuhlner, Sean Hamilton, Monkey Monks Monkey Monastery, Haunted Mystic, Charlotte, Yas the Boss, Madison Crater, Holly Schmidt, Rio, Laura M, Poof Donut, Femboy Fishing, Atheist, Joannis, IW, Arta Aureli, Cornelius Nelson, Demise, Lancaster, Nicole, Ada Avery, Neurofilter, The Coom Slayer, Summer Celine, Jonah Shee, Dominic Johan, Big Time Jim, JP, Broiled Lemming, Jake Everdeen, Almost Dead Again, Jonas, Jared Drake, Erica, Darius Fazier, Lil Bunda, Alex Zenla, and CeeLo. Like I said, life has been incredibly crazy. I'd like to think that in another timeline, maybe this video wouldn't have taken me a whole three months, but hopefully for the people who were looking for this type of video, it was worth the wait. And to everyone else, especially the patrons, I'd seriously like to thank you for your patience with me. I understand how annoying it must be to be donating to me only to not get a video for a whole month, let alone three months. Your patience means the world to me. Each of these three months, I have just barely been able to make rent, and if it wasn't for you all, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it whatsoever. So, thank you for believing in me for so long and having so much faith in me. I cannot describe how much that means, but I'm probably dragging this on, so... See you in a couple weeks for a uh, more traditional video. Thank you.